Good morning. Good morning. Anybody else feeling kind of uh, in the middle of that right now? Kind of a, some of you had things going on this weekend. Some of it's just been a long. We moved this week. And so we moved just a few minutes down Millican Road. Well, we've kind of moved. So half of our stuff is still at the old house. They let us move in to the new house. My wife brought the ironing board to the new house, but all my clothes are at the old house. And it was like, you get what you get today, guys. That's just kind of how it works, you know? It's one of those kind of weeks. Now, now listen, here, here's a key for, for us to understand. I believe it's so important to know that you are not here by accident. I had some conversations this week that just really kind of threw me for a loop. But you need to know that you are not a mistake. You need to know that you matter. I was talking to this person this week, and, and I, I talk to people all the time that struggle feeling like I've got no purpose, I'm not important, and it's just not true. You are valuable, all right? You need to know that because you are. You're important. You are loved. Sometimes for us to even know that or to feel that, we need to get out of our own space. And we need to start looking and finding ways to help others because when we only focus on our needs, on our hurts, and some of you are in the middle of some really deep, hard stuff, I, I understand that. But by only focusing on us, we miss the opportunity that God may have for us to help someone and start to pull ourselves up out of the place where we are. One of the things that we hope this series that we're calling Commissioned helps with is to understand that we're not created by God just to come here to church on a sunny morning and go home and feel good about ourselves and think, hey, that's all I've got to do. Now, now I've got this check off my box when it, comes, when it comes to Jesus. That's not it at all. You don't leave this place not being changed. You don't leave this place and go home to your everyday life and go, yeah, whatever, I went on Sunday, nothing else is new, nothing has, is different in my life. We want you to leave this place challenged to impact the people around you, to do what God has created you to do. That's why you're here to be encouraged and challenged and taught how to do that. So I want to start today before we get to anything else with this challenge, all right, for every single one of you, should you choose to accept it? Here's the challenge. I am commissioning you to find a project, a group of people, a need on Sunday, August 29th, and do something about making this world a better place by accomplishing that project or helping those people or impacting those around you. August 29th, it's a Sunday morning. And we are challenging you to do that. We're calling this Contribute Sunday. And, and I know we've done that in the past. And it's always been in November. And it's always kind of surrounded this Thanksgiving outreach that we've done for Inner City Hamilton. And we're still doing the outreach for Inner City Hamilton. We're still going to do 250 or 300 complete Thanksgiving baskets with turkeys and everything for the people in downtown Hamilton. That's November. But this is August. And we want you to get out of your comfort zone and impact the people around you because that's what God has called us and commissioned us to do. Here's a definition of commission. Are you ready? To appoint someone to the rank of officer in the armed services, he was commissioned after attending midshipman school. All right, that's one definition of commission. What do commissioned officers do in the military? They're managers, they're problem solvers, they're key influencers, and they're planners, and they lead the enlisted personnel in all the situations that they have to do. They were given a job of leading. That's their commission. Now, during our, our teaching team meetings the past couple of weeks, actually past few months as we've been planning this series, uh, it was interesting talking about and finding out that there are a lot of things that are commissioned on places like Etsy, which I have no idea about. I've never been on Etsy. Some of you live on there, okay? I, I get that. But on Etsy, you can commission just about anything. 
Even these little Wonder Woman things like Shelly had commissioned and done for her that I have no idea what it is. I saw a picture. I don't think she's putting it up. But it was commissioned and she paid for it. And you know what that did? That allowed an artist whose talents and gifts were creative and creating things to get paid, which was a nice thing for them to do something for someone that they wanted. That's commissioned. So what are we as Christ followers commissioned to do? What are we commissioned to do? Matthew 28 says this, starting in verse 19. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. All right, that's what we're commissioned to do. Our commission starts by building relationships and making disciples. And how do you make a disciple? You start one-on-one. You start with the people that are closest to you, the relationships that you have. Maybe those people that live under your roof. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's the people on your street. Maybe it's the people that live in the apartment next to you or in the dorm next to you. Jesus was asked this question, what's the greatest commandment of all? And he summed up 613 Jewish commands in these two, Mark 12, 30. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other command is greater than these. Do you have it yet? Love God, love people. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. It's all through the Scripture. Now, now this series that we're calling Commission was based on Acts 1, verse 8, and it's part of that commission for us. And it says this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's the commission. Last week, we looked at Jerusalem, and that's here. Those are the people that are closest to us. All right, those are your families, brothers, sisters, cousins, aunts, uncles. Those are your families, the people that are closest to you. Those are your neighbors. And we talked a lot about our neighbors and who they are and what they are and how we should be responding to them. That's also this church. Your Jerusalem are the people closest to you. Now, we don't focus a whole lot here on inside of these walls. All right, we really focus outside of these walls, but, but inside of these walls, this church, there are some important things that have to happen. We have to be able to teach and train and develop and, and minister to you all as you are here, but you have to do that as well. And so for some of you, these are ministry opportunities that you might want to pick up so that you can help other people coming through the doors of this church to be able to learn and be discipled and trained for Jesus. So here are a few of the, the opportunities that we had talked about last week. The Connect Ministry. We need Bible study, uh, Sunday morning Bible study leader, family and single small group hosts, people that were, work with the Connect pastor on Sunday morning to welcome people into the worship area. Those are just some of the things. They're not, they're not big deals. They're not theological deals, but they're important service opportunities that you can do. Let's look at the next one. High school ministry. Sunday morning adult leaders for guys and girls. Here's what Noah put. You get to hang out, you get to know students, and lead a short breakout group every other week. Is that difficult? No, if you like high schoolers, that's the perfect role for you. You you can make an impact. You can disciple through something like that. High school guys and girls, small group leaders, elementary ministry, they need media techs. You're a computer person? That's kind of what a media tech helps out with. If you can figure out computers, you can figure out anything that a media tech does. All right? Maybe that's you. Maybe you're a large group leader, small group leader. Maybe you're just an assistant. You know, maybe some of our special needs uh, young, young people need a buddy with them, and maybe you could help out with that. It's not hard. It's just committing to serve, to be there, to meet these, these needs. And look, preschool ministry needs. Um, helpers, extra hands, check-in station, backup for infant toddlers, Sundays, 9 a.m., infant teacher, teachers for 1030, toddlers and two teachers. Let's go to the next one. Creative arts ministry. 
Uh, we had two down. Now there's only one that's needed there because Shelly, somebody committed to Shelly. So yeah, that's cool. Now here's what Creative Arts currently is, is, is involved in. It's everything that you see and everything that you're experiencing today, they make that happen. All right, so that's, that's a huge thing. And, and let's go to the next one. What's next? Worship ministry, sound text. Now listen, if you know anything about sound, if you know anything about sound boards, we need you. And maybe if you don't know anything about sound, but you're going, man, this sounds horrible. We need you, all right? No, no, no offense. It sounds great today. That's, that, I'm just, you know, but we need you back there. And so maybe you jump in, maybe you learn some of those skills and you learn some of those techniques to make what people hear, the gospel message, better, easier for them to connect to on a Sunday morning. All kinds of opportunities to, to do that. Now, when you look at this, my question is, did any of you do anything with your Jerusalem, those closest to you after last week's teaching? Or did you walk out of here going, uh, yeah, I don't have anything with that? Now, before we left last Sunday, both services, people came up to me and they say, hey, listen, I want to do something. I want to be part of this commission process. I want to use my one and only life to impact people around me. I want to be part of that commission of Jesus. And that was so cool. I talked to probably four or five families last week that said that, almost those exact words. And you're going, yes, Jesus' kingdom grows because of that. Tracy Mazafari, our preschool pastor, she was so excited. She said, I had three new people commit to my ministry last week, so almost all of my current needs are filled. That's preschool. That's incredible. Now, for any of our pastors to almost fill all their needs, it's like, whew. Because if those needs aren't met, then those preschoolers don't get ministered to, which means that you don't get the opportunity to worship. That's huge. Maybe for you, did, did you meet some of your neighbors this past week? We talked a lot about our neighbors. Did you meet some of your neighbors last week? Again, how many of you know all your neighbors? Do you know the names? Do you know their kids? Do you know, you know, all that? Some of you do, but most of us don't. Why? Because we keep to ourselves. Uh, <laughs> I walk my giant schnauzer. Marcy is a 100-pound giant black schnauzer, and she's phenomenal. She's a great dog. Uh, but I walk her, and she's so friendly. Like, like, she'll go up onto people's porches. She'll go into the garages and lay down. If the door's open, she'll go in their house. I mean, that's, that's just who she is, you know, and, and so she's great. So I get to at least say, hey, how you doing to a lot of people when, it, when I'm walking Marcy in, in the, the current neighborhood. And, and, and we have had so many people, more than I ever dreamed, come up and knock on our door and say, we're really going to miss you in this neighborhood. Now, I think they're just going to miss Marcy. I think that's really what they're going to miss. But you know what? That, that impacted me. It's one of those things where you're going, I didn't realize maybe I was making a difference or making a, a contribution or people seeing me in a certain way. But by walking the neighborhood and waving to people and talking with people and connecting with people, maybe I've done more than I realized. And that was big for us. Shelly Mosteller, our creative arts pastor, sent me this email. She said, a new family moved next door a while back, and, I, and I've talked to the little girl several times, but that's about it. There's a bit of a language barrier, and I felt kind of awkward and insecure about approaching them because I was afraid I wouldn't communicate well. She said, but after Sunday's message, I wanted to do better. So yesterday, the mom and the little girl came to my front door, and the mom asked me, if she could have some of the plants in our front yard. I said, sure. And I followed her outside. Turns out she wanted some of the leaves off of what we thought was a weed. Take all you want. You know, she, the, the woman said, in Nepalese, they use these leaves for medicine. And Shelly said, I told her she could have the whole thing, and she was really happy, and we talked for a while, and then I ended up playing hide-and-seek with the little girl in the front yard, and when I had to go in for dinner, the little girl asked if we could be friends. Shelly said this, she said, we're neighbors, so we should be friends, and the little girl gave her a hug. Isn't that incredible? Just knowing your neighbors 
just connecting to the people around you. That's your Jerusalem. Acts 1.8 again, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so this week we're focusing on Judea and Samaria. And what does that mean? That means the people that live around you but not, might not be close to you. The people that live around you for Samaria that might be a little different than you are but they're still somewhat close. It might be Butler County, it might be Hamilton, it might be Kentucky or Indiana, but they're somewhere close to you. That's your Judea and your Samaria. How many people live in Butler County? Okay, I'm glad you know the county you live in. Do you know anything about Butler County? Well, maybe a little. Let me give you a definition here, some, some background. Butler County was formed by the state of Ohio on March 24th, 1803 from portions of Hamilton County. It is the county, the county seat is Hamilton, right downtown here, where the first fort was built on the bank of the Great Miami River. It's named for Richard Butler of Pennsylvania, a major general of the American Revolutionary War. He died in 1791 fighting American Indians in northern Ohio his army marched out of Fort Hamilton where the city of Hamilton now stands. There are around 400,000 people in Butler County. Friends, that's a lot of people to love. 400,000, including the cities of Hamilton, Fairfield, Trenton, Oxford, Middletown, Monroe, Fairfield Township, Liberty Township, just to name a few. That's our Judea. That's a huge part of who we are. Now, if you're going to love the people around you, then here's the first thing that you have to start thinking about. You need to start thinking about how do people see you? Hmm. How do they see you? When your name comes up in a conversation, what do they say about you? Some of you may not want to know. Some of you need to know, even though you may not want to know. Because some changes need to happen. Do people say about you, man, they're rushed. They're always running late. They're never on time. I can count on them to be here in three hours when they were supposed to be here at, at noon. It's going to be three o'clock. You, you have no time for deep connections. Is that what they think about you when your name comes up? Anybody, when your name comes up, do they say angry? You know, they're just always angry. Anytime anybody sees you, you have a, a scowl on your face. You're short-tempered with the people around you. You snap really easy, especially in traffic. <laughs> you know what? We get into traffic and we become complete different people, don't we? I mean, usually because we're late and our lives are running frantic. That's what happens. Has anybody in this room ever used some not-so-nice hand gestures in traffic? Wow, I don't know who you're pointing to, but everybody look down the row here, this front row. Yeah, almost all of us need to raise our hands for that, right? Last week, I'm pulling out of the parking lot here, at the, here on the Millican Road. I pulled out. I'm, just, I'm going a little bit slow, I guess, and this car was flying coming across the bridge. They weren't, I, I didn't see them when I pulled onto Millican Road, but they were on my bumper, like instantly honking the horn at me, you know, and so I pulled up and I turned down on Indian Trace Drive, the first, first road up here, and they flipped me off when they went past me. Sorry, I didn't mean to, <laughs> this. Online campus, I'm best, I didn't, sorry about that. And, uh, <laughs> whoo, that's not good. Anyway, they flipped me off when they, when they went past. And instinctively, not even thinking, I drove my Jeep, which is a big lifted big Jeep, up onto the grass and the sidewalk, whipped it around, went on Millican Road, and floored it to get on their bumper. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> not lying. Here's, here's what's going through my head. Holy Spirit, love God, love people. Love God, love people. No! <laughs> love God, love people. He made a left on Liberty Fairfield. I intentionally made a right to get myself out of the situation. Love God, love people. How do people see you? Are you happy? When they think of you, that's what they think of. Are you content? Are you needy? 
Maybe you're all of those things at different times. And it just depends on where you are or when somebody saw you. Let me ask this. How did you do going out to eat this week? Again, we're in the moving process. We have no pans, no food at either place at this point. So we've eaten out every night this week. How are you doing eating out this week? How are you doing loving God and loving people and loving your Judea when it comes to your servers? How's your patience when it takes 30 minutes to get your food because there's only two servers in the restaurant? How have you responded to that? Angrily, bitterly, short-tempered? You know, I've read so many articles on the fact that Sunday at lunch is the time where if you're a server, you do not want to work. You get less tips, more aggravated people, and more issues. Do you know who that's from? Us. The church. The church. People are watching you. They know that you're coming from church. You might be in shorts and an old t-shirt and flip-flops. They still know you just came from church, all right, if you're going out to eat at at lunchtime on a Sunday. And I've, guys, read things all the time, and I see people expressing this all the time. One pastor wrote on on their receipt, he said, I give God 10%, why do you get 18? I guarantee you something like that is going to happen at Skyline today at lunch. And it's not going to be me. But I guarantee you that'll happen. I don't think people realize how much their behavior reflects on their faith. This one waitress wrote this. She said, for me, what made the experience so bad wasn't just the rude behavior from these adult women that were gathered there or the cheapness of stiffing me on the tip or the sneakiness of leaving fake money on the table, or the assumption that I was beneath them because I didn't discuss my beliefs with them, or any of the other things that added up into that experience. What really got me was that I was in a place that very day where I was considering going to church. A friend of mine had just committed suicide, and that very church had been recommended to me for grief counseling. She said, I never went. I worked through it on my own, but the point is those rude, presumptuous, and honestly mean women were the only thing standing between me and the church that it was so important for them that I attend. How do people see you in our Judea, in our Samaria? Here's the deal. Once you know this, you can't unknow it. Once you know how you should respond, you can't unknow that. Once you know that when you go to a restaurant that you're representing Jesus and yourself, you can't unknow that. I made this challenge a few weeks ago. How about this? You go out to eat. How about you leave a 30% tip? You leave more tip than what should be there because we're representing Jesus and what we do and how we act and how we respond matters. How do people see you? Once you know, you can't unknow. Then you have to make a decision. And if you choose to ignore it, that's still a decision. And then you have to do something about it. Here's another part of our Judea and Samaria that we don't want to know about. How about the homeless? Don Carpenter, one of our guys, passed. And his funeral was this past week. And Don was so heavily involved in the homeless ministry in downtown Hamilton. He loved just sitting and talking to the broken, hurting people that were there. And he, he was huge with that. Barb Barker, one of our ladies, has been serving the homeless and broken for years. And I, I asked her, I called her, and I asked her for some insight on our Judea and Samaria with the homeless. And she spoke with Kathy Becker, who's one of the leaders uh, in that in the government. She said, the last count they did on homeless people was at the beginning of January 2021, and Butler County, she said, there's about 3,300 homeless people. She estimates about 2,000 of those are in Hamilton alone. That includes people sleeping in tents in the woods in their cars. It's increased about 2% since last count in 2020 due to the lack of affordable housing. And actually, 
the only homeless shelter in Hamilton to serve city that is always at capacity. She says she doesn't feel like 3,300 is an accurate number because of it being done in the dead of winter when a lot of people couch surf with some of their friends just to be able to stay warm for the winter. She said, this was part of my conversation with Barb. As far as the best things that can happen for the homeless, she is, is providing education and resources. As far as job availability, help with job applications, filling them out in the computer, um, there, there's fewer ministries that are out on the streets, is what she's saying right now, than there ever has been in the back, past. Shalom, which is a group of churches that used to open their doors in the wintertime for homeless to sleep indoors, it's no longer in operation, and there's nothing else like that in Butler County. Um, as far as Kathy knows, there's only two ministries that are in Hamilton that have a consistent weekly schedule. Power Source at New Life Missions on the 4th and, and Henry Streets and our CCC's ministry, which is on the streets four days a week, regardless of the weather. There's a food pantry and pickup delivery on Mondays. Our ministry serves the Cove Motel area on Sundays at 4, and then East Avenue about 5 to 5.15. On Tuesdays at East Avenue at about 4.30 till the food is gone. On Friday, we have no set schedule. We pack our cars looking for the, the hungry and the lost and the broken. And Saturday, we're at 7th and Heaton Streets at 1.30. About six different churches, ministries do outreach events about four times a year, usually in warmer months. She said that it was so hard to say where a homeless camp is because currently the government is disbanding all those and running those out. Uh, a lot of people are by the river or heavily wooded lots camping in tents. She said the biggest challenge is how to find a place to give them uh, a shower and something to eat so they can actually go on a job interview and be able to try to find a job because they don't have access to computers or knowledge of the computers. A lot of obstacles that are out there. Now you know that. Now you know that there are people all around here that need support, love, encouragement. Now that you know that, you can't unknow that. You just can't. So you have to make a decision and then you have to do something. I love the scripture, Matthew 25. It says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed and, and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Now you know that. Now you have to decide what you're going to do, and then you have to do it. Maybe for part of us, our Judea and Samaria, maybe it's someplace like the Happy Church in Jackson, Kentucky. Hebrews 13, 16 says, Do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices... God is pleased. We've been going to the Happy Church for several years since Randy Adams, that was one of our campus pastors, said, I've got to go do something. And he picked up, moved his family to Jackson, Kentucky, lived below the poverty line for six or seven years, just serving that community. And so we went, we took a trip down there uh, last weekend, 15 of us, just to help serve whatever. We scrubbed moldy places that water was leaking in a in the clay hole campus and we painted and we built sound table for their for their sound booth at that location we we, we painted porches and scrubbed and and did a lot of great things in just a few days but you need to understand that jackson kentucky that whole area is the third poorest county in the entire united states I mean, inner cities are bad. This is the third poorest county in the entire United States, surrounded by the, thir the, the fourth and fifth and first poorest counties in the United States. There's no market for work there. Maybe you can work at a fast food restaurant. There's a few of those. Maybe you can work at the lumber store or the hardware store. Maybe one of the local businesses. There's nothing else. There are drugs and there's government assistance. 
And if you're growing up in that environment and your parents have had you so they can have money from the government because they get more and more and more money for more and more and more kids, you are just in this place where nobody, you feel like nobody loves you or cares about you. That's what we've been doing in these places. It's just helping, just serving. People come out of the hills for food. People come out of places, they're living places you wouldn't imagine just to get something to eat or just to, just to have somebody talk to them. It's a pretty significant thing. Economically depressed to say the least. I wanted to watch this quick video. This is just, again, we had a blast last weekend doing this, but watch what we were able to do. I think my favorite picture of all those, Jill sitting on the floor painting the legs of the, the sound table we built, and there are four guys sitting over there at the tables just not doing anything. It kind of felt like maybe you work for the government. I don't know. Anyway, it's, um, <laughs> it was so much fun, and it's so much fun to serve, to help, to give, to be part of just pouring into the lives of people, no matter what that is. And now, once you know that, you can't unknow that. Once you know that we do a yearly trip to Happy Church, you can't unknow that. Once you know that's almost always in August, you can't unknow that. We'd love for you to go next year with us. Anybody, any skill levels, any talents can, can, can go, can do that. Here, here's another thing I want to say this. Some of you are going, well, I, I, I don't know that I can do a homeless ministry. That's you know, I, I just don't know. I don't know that, that I'm good with my neighbors. I don't have those relational skills like Shelly has. And, and, and I, I, I just, then what are you good at? What can you do with how God has created you, gifted you, the talents that he's given you? What can you do to impact the people around you, your Judea and your Samaria? Gene Eggleston, one of our guys, he's a writer. He's written several books and, and um, he wrote these um, these songs, and then he had some of his friends sing them, and he put them on CDs, and it's witnesssong.com. Now, it may or may not be your thing type of music, but it's incredible that he did that. It's incredible that he's going, this is how God has gifted me. This is, these are my talents. This is what I'm going to do for the kingdom. This is what I'm going to do for my Jerusalem, my, my Judea, my, Ju and my Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is what I'm going to do, and he put them, you can go on there and listen to them He'll copy CDs and bring them in for free if you want. 
But the thing is, he took who he was and he used his gifts and talents to make an impact. We should all be doing that. That should be part of our weekly lives as Christ followers. Let's get away from the TVs a little bit and start figuring out how we can use our gifts and talents to impact people in the name of Jesus. John 17 says this, I'm praying not only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of them and their witness about me. The goal for all of them to become one heart and mind, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, so they might be one heart and mind with us. Then the world might believe that you, in fact, sent me. Go to your Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Go in Jesus' name. You're commissioned to do that. Father God, I pray for everyone in this room and everyone watching online, God, that you just spark something inside of them. God, allow them to to, to see the need, to, to know what needs to be done, God, and then to decide to do something positive in this world that so much needs positive things. Help us to impact this world for you. And it's in Jesus' name.